Good morning, church. How are we doing, everybody? Woo! Let's all stand. Let's get ready to worship. Come on. Man, who's excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen? Come on. Woo! Again, it's our expectancy for Him to move and for Him to touch and change lives that actually gives Him the opportunity to come, amen? Because our God's a good God. Unless we welcome Him, unless we, unless we open up our hearts to what He wants to do, it just becomes something about us, amen? But thank God that we're not here for us. We're not here about for songs we want to sing or just for another message or just to play church. We're here to be in the presence of a living God who's faithful, who's sovereign, who has a name and his name is Jesus, amen? Come on, so let's all pray. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. God, we say, come, have your way. Do what only you can do, God. We ask right now. God, we humble ourselves and we come before you. God, we say we don't want to sing songs. We don't want to hear another message. We want to meet with you, God. We want the chains to break in our lives. Chains of oppression, chains of depression, chains of guilt and shame and condemnation, God. And we ask, release freedom in this house today, Jesus. God, may your name be lifted high. God, may you restore and redeem and refresh and fill us up, God, so that we might be used to be your hands and feet everywhere we go. God, we say we're here for you today. We exalt your name alone. We bless you. We praise you for all that you are. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Come on, let's worship. Oh, 
For the cross beat the crane Let heaven and earth proclaim This is our God, King Jesus from the grave, King Jesus, pay for my sins, King Jesus. the name above every heaven name and Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever we live for you we live for you crossing holy Worthy of all the praise we give. 
sing your love to those you're holy you're holy there is no one like you there is none beside open up my eyes oh show me You know, this is one of my uh, one of my favorite songs because it's talking about trust. And I once heard a, a message. It was talking about the difference between faith and trust. And trust is after faith. It's after he's already proven himself. It's like you you let your kid borrow the car but you let them do it because they get good grades and they're respectful and they listen. So they've proven themselves. So when you give them the car, you know it's gonna be returned in one piece because they've been faithful. And like we're gonna hear today, you know, God has proven himself over and over and over. And so it doesn't matter when things feel uncomfortable because in this life, things are gonna feel uncomfortable. Things are gonna shake. But this, this inside, this we know will not be shaken. And so when we sing this song, that's exactly what we're proclaiming. We're We're proclaiming that he is the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's proven himself over and over. And so no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, he is still in control. Amen. So we're going to sing that one more time just because repetition helps. Amen. Oh, and I will build my life
just with your heart in me in your love to those around me
song Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one There is no higher name Jesus, you reign above it all Hallelujah, that was good, amen? Come on Again, if you guys didn't know a good friend of ours, Jared Klein from Agape, was leading with us this morning, so it was exciting to have him here. And Taya worshiping with us. Uh, known Jared since he was a little kid, and um, man, just able to bring the presence of God and has amazing pipes. Man, just, just beautiful. That was, that's a gift for sure. And can we give a round of applause for our worship team too? Come on. Most of you guys don't realize, but they come and practice for multiple hours on Thursday, and they prepare, just like in life, mini sermon here. Check this out. When you're prepared and you're faithful, then when God calls you, you're able and ready to be used by him. Amen? You're able to be led by his spirit. But if you're not prepared, then again, musically, you're up here and you're looking at charts and trying to figure out where to go and you can't hear his voice. So again, I'm grateful for our team. Um, they don't just come and we don't, here at the bridge, we don't believe the worship is just the music before the message. Amen. We believe that the worship is us re realigning our hearts, centering our hearts with his, reminding ourselves of who he is and what he's done, that the work has been finished, that we don't worship for breakthrough, but we worship in a place of breakthrough that God has already done already. The work has been finished, amen? It's our chance to receive that. So when you praise him in the midst of your storm, when you raise a hallelujah in the midst of your trial, that's when it means something, and that's when it says in his word that he inhabits the praises of his people, that he inhabits the offering of his people. So when we worship, it's not just singing Christian kumbaya, amen? We're raising a hallelujah, we're raising an offering, a sacrifice of praise. And when you worship and it actually costs you something, I promise God will inhabit it every time, amen? That was good, Pastor Justin. So glad that you're back. That's good, come on, here we go. <laughs> Oh, I miss, I miss, I love our church. I love what God's doing here. I love his presence. Um, really quick, a tithe. Again, I want to thank you guys for being faithful to sow in to this ministry. Again, we acknowledge that it's by God's grace alone, by his faithfulness alone, that we are here. That it'll be five years this October. How crazy is that? Amen. Second building, God's doing so much. Our family is growing, continuing to give us influence and impact in our city, in our region, in our, in our nation. That's what we want to have. And so again, thank you guys for your faithfulness to sow. Second Corinthians says this, says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Hallelujah, right? Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able, amen? Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, he is able. To bless you abundantly so that in all things, and how much? All. all things, at all times. All What times? All. all times. Having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Amen? Come on, tithe, tithing, giving to the Lord is, is principle of first fruits. It's not just saying, God, I'm going to give you a little bit of the leftovers. Like uh, Jared was sharing, faith takes no faith to give God your leftovers. It takes so much faith to give him your first fruits. God, I trust you that everything I have comes from you. And so I'm giving this back to you. Why? So that I'm honoring, I'm remembering who you are and what you've done. And I'm giving you the 10% so you'll bless the 90. Too much of the time, you and I live this false reality or, or, or false doctrine that, God, I'm going to give you the leftovers and I'm going to still pray that you're going to bless the rest. He doesn't work like that. Amen. It takes faith to say, God, I'm going to give you my first fruits so that you'll bless the rest. Amen. We are blessed to be a blessing. We have to remember that church. Amen. So again, four ways to give. Again, give in faith. Trust that God, you cannot outgive God. Amen. We've shared testimony after testimony. God is faithful. And so again, thank you guys. I want to encourage you guys for being faithful to trust God, not only with your finances, but with your lives. Amen. Come on, let's pray. God, thank you so much. God, we acknowledge today that you are Jehovah Jireh, God, that you provide all of our needs. God, that we never go for lack. God, that it says in your word that the righteous will never beg for bread. And so Jesus, again, we thank you for what you have already done. 
And so, God, as we give back to you, God, may it be a form of worship in our hearts, acknowledging of who you are and what you've done. God, again, may you remind us, God, with every breath that we have, that we've been blessed to be a blessing. God, so we just honor you today. God, not only with our finances, but with our lives. God, we honor you as we give you the first fruits of our week. God, as we gather together to raise your name. So we bless you today. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Got a quick video for you real quick. Here we go. showing you guys that because, and again, in like 30 days, we're going on our men's trip up to Rock and Water to the Sierras, and then we're also going on our youth trip, and so that's what all the Krispy Kremes are out there for. Um, Rock and Water every year, it's just be, gosh, over 10 years now, I've been going up with young people to the Sierras, amazing place to get rid of your electronics and hear God's voice. We focus on identity every time because we need the next generation to not only know who he is, but they need to know who they are in him, amen? And so again, I wanna encourage you guys, even if you don't like donuts, donate, so into that, amen? Come on, sponsor kids. The trip's about 1,200 bucks per kid. We always charge around 400, 450 and believe God for the rest. So that's a big nut that we've got to crack for 40 some kids. So um, again, thank you guys. God's always been faithful. And again, know that you're changing a young person's life. And, and we have our envelope wall coming pretty soon too. So every single kid, student, as well as leader is going to be prayed for for the next month that God will wreck their lives for his sake. Amen? So again, I want to encourage you guys that Krispy Kreme youth fundraiser again get out there $15 a dozen if you don't want donuts just donate it amen come on um and then if you did do pre-orders for that you can pick those up today from 8 to 11 it's past 11 so you donated the rest amen that'll be good um next uh anything else that I missed you can check your bulletins amen come on can we give Kurt a round of applause <laughs> Woo. Kurt and Deb have been here from the beginning. 
uh, even before that, you know, City Church, and they've been just not only a blessing to me and Katie and our family personally and our leadership team and ministry, but they, they're a gift in this church family. And again, like we say all the time, it's not by chance that God brought you here. It's by God's divine purpose that every single one of you has a role to play in the story. Kurt is a mighty, mighty man of God. And when you hear their testimony, Deb is a mightier woman of God. Amen? Come on. She's insane. Um, and both this couple is not only filled with wisdom, but they passionately love Jesus. They passionately love our country. They passionately love seeing God use them to change people's lives for his sake. Amen? So again, I want you to extend your hands. We're going to receive the word that God put on his heart today for us. It's incredible. God, thank you so much for Kurt. God, I thank you for the man of God that he is, God. And again, I, I believe the Lord wants to rewrite that on you for your identity today, uh, reminding you that, again, I've created you for such a time as this, that you are a mighty man of God, that he's pleased with you. God, I thank you, God, for what you've done in Kurt's life. God, I thank you for the gift that him and Deb are, God, in this church family and in your kingdom. I ask Holy Spirit, fill him with your spirit today, God. Overwhelm him with your presence, God. May your words be his words. I pray supernatural boldness and confidence upon him to release the word of the Lord that you've put upon him. God, so we open up our hearts and receive the word that you put upon his heart today, and we thank you for this man of God. And all those people said, amen. amen. Come on. Well, okay then. Good morning. Oh, that sounded really good. My name is Kurt Brown. And I don't know if I deserve to be here on prime time. But I, I certainly appreciate this body of believers. It's been fun watching what God has been doing in this place. I want to uh, thank my wife who supported me this weekend by leaving me alone and letting me just get into the word. She prayed for me. She fed me. She made sure that my focus was on God, and that's what she does. So I love you, and I thank you for that. If you don't know her, stand up, Debbie. If you guys don't know her, stand up. Forty-something years. <laughs> Forty-five, right? Forty-one? Yeah, see? 40 something. That's right. I want to thank uh, Pastor Justin for allowing me to have his pulpit. Um, not, it's just, a, there's not a lot of people that, that do that. And it's a, it's a big thing when they trust you with the pulpit. So I, I, I appreciate you and Katie and the rest of the staff as well. But uh, I just want to pray before we get going. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this, this time to break bread. You, the Bible says that you are the bread of life. So we want to break bread, Father, and ask that you come in and move me aside, that your word can be shared, that you prepare the hearts of your people, Lord, to receive your engrafted word. And I thank you for this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. This was a, an easy message to receive. I received this a few months ago. But preparing it, it was difficult because the more I spoke, the harder it got. Especially when you're looking out and you're, you have to share this with people. This is your heart that you're, you're, you're sharing. So I'm just asking that God just kind of gets me through this. I want to thank AJ and, and at the very beginning because I went through so many twists and changes and he was able to accommodate me. And so I'm praying that he's going to uh, just kind of be there taking me through it. He's on the spot right now. 
I need to remove my glasses, not because I don't want to see you, but be so that I can see. <laughs> the question that the Lord asked me to ask you is, are you his people? Yes. See, we're going to be coming out of the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14. It says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Second Chronicles chapter 714 probably is one of the most quoted passages of scripture in times of trouble, in times of national crisis. It's used as a rallying cry to pull the people of God together. But frankly, I believe there's a portion of the church that's really not sensitive to that cry. They don't understand if they're his people or not. What part of the church is yet to be determined? Hopefully it will be by the end of this message. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 is a response from God to Solomon after Solomon in chapter 6 dedicated the temple. Solomon presented six scenarios to God. Each scenario had three components to them. The three components were a nation, God's people, going in the wrong direction. God's judgment against the nation for going in the wrong direction. And a remedy, a way for his people to get back under his covering. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, whose first encounter with God as a king was in a dream. God tested Solomon, said, listen, ask of me whatever you will, and I'll give it to you. And rather than asking for long life and riches, Solomon only wanted one thing. He wanted to know how to judge God's people. Rather than, and, and because he didn't ask for long life and riches, God gave those to him anyway. The Bible says that he died in a good old age full of days, riches, and honor. In order for any of God's people to understand the sixth scenario that Solomon presented on the day he dedicated the temple, we, his people, have to understand that there is a difference between what God calls right and what God calls wrong. It's important for us to see that while the world is still trying to create God in their image, God already made us in his image. And while the world is trying to tell us what's right and, and what's wrong, their relative truth, the absolute truth, was established at the beginning in creation. We, his people, also have to understand that he is way different from us. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as, high, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. About 15 years ago, I was witnessing to a student, and I was sharing with her the gospel. And as I shared, she said, Kurt, I believe, but I'm just having difficulties with the faith. Good people, bad things are happening to good people. And people are suffering, she said. So as I was listening to her list of grievances, the Lord told me to ask her if she was smarter than him. So I, and that's what I said. So you're smarter than God. And she said, no. I just think things need to be done differently. <laughs> so I said, so you're better than God. And she said, no. Do you think good people should be going to hell? And I said, so he doesn't know what he's doing. And she said, no, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, and then she stopped. And she started processing our conversation. And her eyes welled up with tears. And then she said, because she had this squeaky voice, oh my gosh. <laughs> but she repented right there and rededicated her life to Christ. That young lady realized that God's ways were certainly higher than her ways. And that's what she did. That's a my people thing right there. 
because that's what God is requiring of us. When we see that we're in the wrong, quickly turn. Quickly turn. And that's what she did on the dime. And she is still serving God today. So why do I believe that a part of the church is not understanding the significance of verse 14? Because the body of Christ is not unified on national issues. On issues that divide the nation, the body of Christ is also on, divided on those. On issues like abortion, marriage, gender, race, the church too is divided. You can ask the average churchgoer how they feel on these issues, and they'll tell you. And you might, by hearing them, come to the conclusion that we are unified in these, but they're not, I can guarantee you. They might tell you, I think this is wrong, I think that is wrong. They might quote some scripture, but we're not unified. It's a different story when we get down to it. It's a way different story, especially when it comes to Tuesday. Ask your neighbor, what are they going to do on Tuesday? The Bible says that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 16, that you shall know them by their fruit. Not fruit singular, but fruits, plural. If I'm a fruit-bearing tree, whether I'm bearing good fruit or bad fruit, I'm bearing a bunch of fruit. I'm dropping them in the yard. <laughs> On Tuesday, which is typically election day, my vote counts as fruit. So let me first spotlight the part of the church that does, that does understand the importance of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. They understand that God was in this country at its inception. They see God's hand in its founding. They see primary source documents like the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and they see God's hand in that. But they also recognize that over the past 50 or so years that the, America has been going in the wrong direction. Whereas sadly, the part of the church that doesn't see the significance or the seriousness of verse 14 has been convinced that America has never been on the right path. And frankly, the only hand they see in this country is the hand of oppression and the hand of slavery. If my people don't recognize my hand, my works, and my way, how will they recognize their wrong in my way? That was my little friend in the lab. She recognized her wrong in his way. And wasn't that Jesus' issue with the Pharisees? They didn't recognize that through him the Heavenly Father was at work. Jesus healed the blind and the lame, overturned the tables of the money changers. And they still had the audacity, the religious rulers of the time still had the audacity to ask him, by what authority doest thou these things? Have you ever noticed how Jesus handled his detractors? He always flipped it, flipped it back on them. He said, I will ask you one thing, and if you tell me, then I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From men, from heaven, or from men? Now, they refused to answer the question because they knew that if they answered it correctly, Jesus would hold them accountable. Well, why aren't you pressing in? If it's from heaven, why aren't you pressing in? And why are you fighting me? But they also knew that if they answered it wrong, that the people would hold them accountable. You mean you, you see all of these wonderful works in here and you don't see that's the hand of God? You're leading us. You, we're following you and you can't see that that's the hand of God? That's where the people of God should be today. We should be able to see who's leading us and whether they're leading us in the right direction or not. So they slickly said, we cannot tell. 
that'll get us out of it. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. There are Christians who believe that America never started out righteous. I heard a prominent national pastor say a couple of years ago, that the Constitution is a racist document. And that Independence Day is not a celebration for us. He was hurt when he said that, so it hurt me to hear him say that. But my heart was broken because he said it. You're leading people all over the world. You are blessed beyond measure. You are living better than most of the people in the world. And you can't see that the hand of God is in this nation. But this is the question. These are the ones that I would like to pose this question to. Just the way Jesus posed the question to the Pharisees. If I can reference Matthew chapter 5 verse 15. Who made this country a city set on a hill? Whereas over 200 years, millions of people have left their lands to sacrifice all they had to come to this land to call themselves American. Who made this country great? Old white men or God? I can, expect what, I can expect the same answer that the Pharisees gave Jesus. Either I cannot tell or crickets. <laughs> but I will tell you this, the people that need to figure out, the part of the church that needs to figure out if they're God's people are those that believe that this country was never great. Now, I... I promise you I'm going to get to the I'm going to get to the text. As we were um, coming back from North Carolina, our pilot told us that in order to get a for a smoother ride, you had to rise above the turbulence. And So we're trying to get up a little higher right now. And I guess, I guess I should have started with this disclaimer. The views and opinions ex expressed by our speaker today might not be endorsed by the management or staff of this fellowship. I, 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 just, wanted, I just wanted to take our pastoral staff off the hook. If you're going to send emails, then you don't send them to Carmelo or Fred. Well, you can send them to Carmelo. Carmelo can handle it. Carmelo can handle it. Or you can send them to me. The graphics? Are the graphics up there? It's not there? OK. Anyway, we're having technical difficulties. As Rick Green was here from Wall Builders a few months ago, he quoted Benjamin Franklin bringing clarity to a room full of confusion and bickering among the delegates of the, 18, the 1787 Constitu Constitutional Convention. And as, as Benjamin Franklin addressed the members, it was the single most speech that put that convention back on track. He said, sir, I lived a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, how can an empire rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred writings, that except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed. No 
we, should, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. It was men who dared to invite the living God into this great experiment, ex great experiment that made this country great. If I can give you a little perspective on how I view history. I wasn't there, despite what Reuben might tell you, I wasn't there when Jesus was crucified. But, I be but because I believe that he died on the cross for me, my faith is in the resurrected Savior. I don't just see my salvation starting at the point that I accepted Jesus as my Savior. I take it all the way back to the cross because that's the history of our faith. I would have a poor frame of reference if I just saw it starting on the day of my salvation. I would be a me-oriented Christian. Jesus died for me, therefore I live for me. But if I take it back to the cross where Jesus died for all, then I live for all. And likewise, I have an allegiance to this country in the same manner. Not because of old white Christians, but because I believe the hand of the God of my faith was there at its inception. I would have a poor frame of reference if this, of this country if I just saw it starting when the slave ships came to shore. I would be with my hand out and my finger out pointing and accusing. And my other hand out looking for reparations. Kind of like what's going on today. But if I take it back to the point where the father stuck his hand in this country, then all I can hear is Joseph revealing himself to his brothers, who said, I am, a, I am in a place of God. What you thought, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. You don't owe me anything. For over 40 years, God has been blessing my, my family. He's put us in places that we never dreamed of being. That's the God that I serve. If any aggression has been shown me because of the color of my skin, my God has been an equalizer. He goes before me. I don't look for him to do any damage to people because I expect him to do it. I, I just expect him. I don't look for him to pay back people. I just expect him to do it. And he does it. So that's the God I serve. And here's the deal. Five years ago, he could have taken me away from here. I was on the bed that people said that Kurt's leaving. But he saw to keep me here for such a time as this. We forget that God was, has always been in the process of nation building. He, in Job chapter 12, verses 23 and 24, he says, he builds up nations, he destroys them. He expands nations, he abandons them. He strips kings of understanding and leaves them wandering in pathless wasteland. They grope in the darkness without a light, and they make them stagger like drunkards. Now, if you've been paying attention to the news today, what this passage of scripture just gave me is a low-hanging fruit that I'm not gonna touch. But you understand. See, I'm just trying to give us a clear frame of reference so that when the alarm of if my people sounds again, that not a part of the church will show up, but all of the church will show up. As Solomon dedicates the temple in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, he presents six hypothetical situations. And mind you, these are hypothetical prayers. Have you ever heard of those? These are hypothetical prayers. One out of the six is, one out of the six deals with a one-on-one -on -one offense. 
Four out of the six are where a nation, his people, have offended him. And then there's one that deals with, immig with immigration. Now, I'm not going to go through all six of them. I'm just going to touch on three, because all of them have the same theme. They all have the same remedy. So 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 24, 26, and 28. Verse 24 says, if your people Israel are defeated by their enemies because they have sinned against you. Now, you know we have been entangled in war in the Middle East for almost 20 years, maybe a little more. We're finally out of there. Now, I'm not going to say that we were defeated, but it certainly didn't feel like a victory the way we left there. Verse 26 says, if, thy, if the skies are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you. Verse 28 said, if there's a famine in the land or a plague or crop disease or attacks of locusts or caterpillars, or if your people's enemies are in the land besieging their towns, whatever disaster or disease there is because they have sinned against you. These three verses have a remedy that can be summed up in verses 26 and 27. Yet, if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sins when, they, when, when thou hast afflicted them, then hear thou from heaven, forgive, their, forgive the sin of thy servant and of thy people Israel. Recognize that you're in judgment. Consider who's judging you. Go humbly before him, begging for forgiveness, and confess your sins. Confessing your sins... That's something that we've gotten away from. Amen. We typically hear or ask people, is, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Do you believe he died for you on the cross? Yes. Confessing your sins, we kind of leave that part out. Amen. God, I've wronged you. I've lived my life for me all my life without even considering you. Wow. I used to teach my kids, you want to be forgiven? Don't come up to me saying, sorry, I'm sorry. That's not going to cut it. That's not going to cut it. You want to be forgiven? You let your mother and I know how what you, you know that what you did affected us. Then if my heart's not hard, <laughs> then I might trust you again. In one verse, Solomon said, we have sinned, we have done amiss, we have dealt wickedly, pouring their hearts out about their wrong. And that right there is the path to forgiveness. If I've wronged you, I'm coming before you, willing to, to accept whatever penalty you have for me. Accept whatever the consequence, I'm willing to take it. That's how much I want to get back into your graces. Unfortunately, some people are, are just a little unreal, unrealistic about what they mete out. The hoops they want you to jump through to get back into their graces. There are two things that you can count on people thinking themselves more highly than. They think themselves that they have more compassion than God. And on the other side, they think, them, they think that they can inflict more pain than God. So in other words, you get on my bad side, I want you to suffer, and I want you to suffer, and I want you to suffer, I want you to feel it. Let's get this settled. There's nobody more compassionate than God. And then it, regarding inflicting pain, you can take your worst tyrant and all the pain that he causes in this lifetime is only but a minute compared to what you will have to face if you're on the wrong side of God for eternity. And this is why Jesus said, don't fear the person that can destroy your body. Fear the one that can destroy both your body and your soul. If I can revisit verse 26 and verse 28 again, because verse 26 says, when the heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against thee. You know, this speaks of a drought. 
not caused by climate change. Not because we've ignored the science, but because we've offended God. Verse 28 says, if there's a famine in the land, or a plague, or crop disease, or attacks of locusts, or caterpillars, or if your people's enemies besiege your towns, whatever disaster or whatever disease, and it's not like that we're seeing any of this going on today. I mean, we just came out of a, almost a seven-year drought. It was, we had a good rain a few months ago, but we don't know where that's going. And as far as diseases and pandemics, we know, we know what we've gone through there. But these two speak to where we are today. And, they, and the way I read these verses is that these are judgments against bad decisions. Not because we've ignored science or offended an, indig an indigenous people or by taking captive people into slavery for hundreds of years. I mean, I've read equally bad things happening to the children of Israel. And God was in it. He, and he was watching it all go down. Regional food shortages, famine, regional water shortages, drought, diseases on humans and crops, pestilence. The Bible identifies all of these as judgments from God for offending him for offending him. His people should be able to recognize that the hand of God moves against poor policies set in place by people Amen. we put in office. Amen. Did you hear that? See, we can't... We, we can't... A lot of us are ashamed to say this out loud because we know that the world will ridicule us. You're saying that all this is happening because of a God that you can't see is doing this? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, because that's what this is saying. Either we be, believe this or we don't. If we don't, we, just, we should just fold this up and do benediction right now. The other religion, climate change, says it's happening because we're offending the earth. One preacher said, and I quote, it's happening because America has offended, offended other nations. America's chickens have come home to roost. See, we're caught up in the news today, them telling us who we're offending. And there are many believers, churchgoers, that take that as gospel. We watch ABC, NBC, MSNBC, CNN, Fox, all of those, and we treat them as if they're the gospel. This is the gospel. This, this is where believers should be drawing their news from. As I mentioned, we have a myriad of resources from political analysts to science, scientists to historians that can help correct our thinking and who rebut everything that they see on the news today. But we don't trust them because the news has poisoned that well. As believers, we need to come together and hit those sources. But these are the ones who believe that America never started out righteous, who go to church on Sunday and raise a hallelujah. And then on Tuesday, they vote against the principles of God. So what do you mean, Kurt? God's not on the ballot. The righteousness of God and his principles are always on the ballot. Whether it's saving babies in the womb, traditional marriage, our relationship with Israel, your right to exercise your faith in church, in your home, on your job, those used to be protected. I mean, they're still protected under the Constitution, but nobody's protecting them because of the people we're putting in office. One of the most important items on the ballot is choosing leaders. Remember, we have four books in the Bible that specifically speak to what a righteous ruler is and what a wicked ruler is. The book of Kings and the book of Chronicles. That's all that talks about, righteous rulers and wicked rulers. 
Proverbs 39, 2 says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn. Are we rejoicing or are we mourning today? I remember back in 2018, a number of clergy men were of various races and denominations were marching in opposition of the Trump administration. And they said, for all to hear, they were walking down this boulevard and they had all these people behind them in banners, their white collars, looking stoic. They stopped in front of the camera and they said, in this midterm, in this midterm election, there are issues more, more important than abortion and marriage. That was religious leaders acknowledging that God is on the ballot, but we don't care. And like the Pharisees, they weren't quite sure whose people they were. Neither our news outlets, our education system, nor the entertainment system industry wants you to know that this was a Christian nation. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody back then was a Christian. It just means that the principles that this nation was founded on were founded on Judeo-Christian values. There are a lot of Christians that believe, Kurt, you're not going to find a godly ruler, a, go a godly politician. You're not going to find one. I don't believe that. Actually, I don't believe that because I had an Andy Caldwell sign in my yard a few years ago. And I think the only reason why he lost is because a lot of Christians weren't voting for him. But let's say for the, for the sake of argument that that's true, that you're not going to find a godly leader. What, what do we do? Look at Luke 9, verse 49 and 50. It's a conversation be between Jesus and his disciple, John. And John says, we saw one driving out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he is not one of us. And Jesus said, don't stop him, because whoever is, not against, whoever is not against you is for you. If there's a politician that's not a Christian, whose lifestyle is questionable, whose manner is boorish, but he or she loves the nation of Israel, he or she believes in protecting the unborn, believes that loving a country that God made doesn't make you a racist, but makes you appreciative. If he or she is not against you, they're for you. I'm not stumping for that administration. I'm just, I was just blown away by all the remarks and comments that Christians had against that administration for all that it was doing it, it, it blew me away. One of the biggest criticisms, criticisms that I heard against that administration was this. He's only putting those policies in place to pacify the Christians. To that I say, so what? Are you not a Christian? Who's being pacified today? Listen, I get the old adage, I was born a Democrat, I'm going to die a Democrat. I get that. I used to hear it a lot. I was raised around that. But here's my suggestion to you. Don't die that way. Because if you die a Democrat, you're going to be judged as a Democrat. And likewise, if you die as a Republican, you're going to be judged as a Republican. When you leave here, you want to find yourself leaving here as a person of God so that you can be judged as a person of God. I don't trust a one of them. They're all crooked, not one. I can accept that one too. That is, if you don't vote. If you're saying that in voting, you're saying, I trust somebody. So let's get down to the meat of the matter. I call this the front half of, of the scripture. Second Chronicles 7, 12 through 15. After the temple was dedicated, 
The celebration is over. Solomon's in his chamber. God shows up. And he says, I've heard thy prayer. Your hypothetical prayers, um, that's just amazing to me. I've heard your prayers. I've chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. And thank you for acknowledging that it is me that causes these things. That's what I'm hearing God say. For if I shut up the heaven that there be no rain, if I command the locusts to devour the land, if I send a pestilence among my people, if my people, see, th th now, it, now it means something. Front half, back half, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And that's the part I like because that's, a, that's an antidote for environmentalists. I will heal their land. The way things are happening today, it's happening because my people have stepped away from me. But if they repent and confess their sins and turn from their ways, then I will forgive them and I will heal their land. Now my eyes, my eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made unto this place. Aren't we glad that we don't have to turn toward a temple to pray? Amen. He's paying attention to what's going on here. We, need, we probably need to check ourselves, huh? If we're being judged by God, maybe it's because we fail to see his hand in this land. Perhaps we should acknowledge that it is him that we've offended and that it is him we need to repent to. If we really believe this book the way we say we do, the greater offense is offending God. If we believe when all is said and done that Jesus is the one we will answer to, then we will do what Solomon is asking us to do. We'll, we will acknowledge that it's not the earth, it's not science, it's not a people, but it's him, our God, that we're offending. Please don't make the mistake that others have made in hearing my convictions. Don't look at this as me talking politics. This is me just pointing out that this system of governance in this land was set up by believers who dared to invite the God, the living God, into this nation building process. I believe that we're going to be judged on the way we choose our leaders and embrace their policies. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in, it, in their body according to that they have done, both good and bad. Won't you stand? If we are his people, then we will do what this says, the whole body. We will acknowledge that we've ignored his hand. We will acknowledge that we have sinned against God. We will acknowledge that we've chosen identities over righteousness. We chosen to protect classes of people, races of people over the things of God. If we are truly his people, we will all repent. You know, we're, we're looking for a revival. You hear every pastor talk about that. In the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost showed up, it only showed up for one reason and one reason only. The people were in agreement. If the body of Christ gets this, recognize that it's God who we, we've been offending in this land because the things that make this country work are still in place. The Constitution is still fixed. As Rick Green said, it's the long, longest running ongoing Constitution in the world. All we need to do is put the right people in place. 
So God, I come to you acknowledging our wrong, it's recognizing that we have embraced the policies of the world, asking that you would forgive us, asking that you would hear from heaven and forgive us for our sins and that you would heal this land. This I ask in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Amen.